And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Washington State Budget and Policy Center, we are a research organization dedicated to advancing the prosperity of all Washingtonians. As we've done in years past, uh, we are hosting these budget beat calls throughout the session to provide information and relevant news from Olympia. This is our first call for the 2015 session, so uh, bear with us as we uh, figure out some of the logistics on our end, um, but then also please do stay tuned for additional calls in the future. We uh, will be hosting them um, throughout the session. Before we dive in, just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, there are several uh, participants on the line, so we've muted uh, all of the lines to avoid background noise. If you do have a question uh, throughout the call, please feel free to chime in through the chat um, option on this service, and you can ask a question. Uh, we'll be addressing uh, Q&A in the last 10 minutes of the call. Um, we are also recording this phone call, so if you have to jump off for any reason or you want to re-listen to it later, it will be posted to our website, which is budgetandpolicy.org. And uh, if you have any future topics for idea, or future topic ideas for budget beat calls, uh, please also chat us um, your suggestions. We'd love to hear from you. So the agenda for today's call is we're going to um, be joined, as we know, with Representative Jenkins on the capital gains tax. She's going to provide us an overview of the legislation and actions that are occurring in Olympia. And then we'll turn it over to Andy Nicholas here with the Budget and Policy Center who will provide some further details on the policy components and impacts of the capital gains tax. Um, and because of the representative's busy schedule, she's going to be joined with us for the first half of this call. And so um, we are going to just kick it off to her so we can get started. So Rep Representative Jenkins, I'm going to turn it over to you. Can you uh, briefly describe the capital gains tax proposal that is before the legislature? Sure, I, I'm happy to, uh, Anne, and <clears throat> thanks for having me on the call, and I just love talking about this topic. And uh, actually, before I start, I just do want to thank the Budget and Policy Center. Actually, this will be, the Budget and Policy Center brought me a capital gains tax as an idea a couple of years ago, and we've been slowly kind of pushing this forward over the last two sessions. And I'm happy that you know the governor took a look at it and decided it was something that he wanted to do uh, too. And so I'm I'm prime sponsoring the uh, the OFM request piece of legislation on the capital gains tax bill, and I just filed it earlier this week. So. Uh, the governor's well, the the, the bill that uh, that I filed and the governor's proposal would would have a seven percent excise tax on capital gains. So for those who um, you know don't pay much attention to types of taxes, an excise tax, and Andy Nicholas will probably talk about this, but is really taxes on, on things where you you earn money from selling something, mostly stocks and bonds, frankly. But uh, this provides an exemption um, for capital gains uh, below $25,000 for individuals or $50,000 as a couple. So if you earn uh, as a couple less than $50,000 uh, in capital gains, and it will be based on your federal income tax return, then you don't, uh, you don't pay any uh, tax on it. For someone like me who's actually never had a capital gain um, in my life, uh, so I'm, I feel pretty safe. Um, uh, it, th this, one of the things about this is it affects a really tiny fraction of the state's taxpayers. So there's about 31,000 people we know in Washington State who have, uh, who file on their federal forms and have capital gains. And just about a thousand of those folks would pay 50% of the total taxes. So this is really focused on very high, um, high income earners. Uh, it exempts most. It exempts almost all retirement accounts and and homes, your primary residence, and farms and forestry. Uh, we're one of only nine states that doesn't have a capital gains tax, and our tax would be lower than all of the the states that surround us, including Idaho, Oregon, California. All of them have higher taxes. So. Hopefully that gives you a, a high-level overview, just so folks have a sense of how much revenue this would bring in. Uh, in the 1517 biennium, which is the budget we're going to be adopting this year, the projection is it would bring in almost $800 million. Uh, and then in the following biennium, uh, it would bring in uh, uh, 
I don't. Uh, it would bring in about double that, right? So almost uh, six. I, I, how do you say that? Sixteen hundred million. I guess that's. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so I, anyway, we're excited. I'm excited about this because there's a couple reasons. First of all, people should be paying their fair share in t of taxes to to make sure that we have the state and the communities that we want to have here in Washington. And right now, that's not happening. We are the most tax regressive state in the nation. So the capital gains tax is is our, I think, our first big step forward at reversing that regressivity and saying, listen, people, pay your fair share, contribute to K-12 education, to contribute to mental health funding, contribute to higher ed, do it in a fair way, let's have the services that the people of the state want to have, and capital gains will help us get there. So uh, hopefully I'm not too all over the place, but that's my little pitch on capital gains. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I think you did a good job kind of outlining there, uh, as you said, an, uh, a high-level overview of what the uh, proposal is. Um, so one of the questions that we have here, too, is uh, really to try and get a better understanding of what the capital gains tax is and what it is not. So I'm going to quickly turn it over uh, to Andy here, but Representative, please feel free to jump in at any time if you want to uh, to, to um, add anything here. Oh, thank you very much, Anne. Um, and Representative Jenkins was uh, exactly right. That as you'll see um, in this graph here that shows up, really what we're talking about here is a tax on a very tiny percent of Washingtonians, mostly those at the very top of the income scale. And really, this is a tax on corporate stocks and bonds or profits from the sales of those particular high-end financial assets. All of the orange shaded region in the graph that you can see, so nearly 80%, is in one way or another tied to uh, corporate stocks and bonds. The largest share, about 40%, come from stocks and bonds that are traded through hedge funds and other sort of elite investment clubs. Individually owned stocks and bonds account for about 30% of capital gains, uh, mutual funds around 12%, um, and then smaller shares for real estate uh, and a smattering of other assets. So really what we're talking about here is a, a tax that is primarily impacts corporate stocks and bonds, and when you sell those in total for a gain of over $50,000 a year, which uh, as we've said, really uh, keeps the tax at a, at a pretty tiny share of the population. Uh, I do think it is important to be clear about what this tax is not, uh, and this next slide lists just a few of the things that um, people might be concerned about but that are actually would not be impacted by this tax. As uh, Representative Jenkins said, this is not a tax on most retirement accounts. Anything that you have in a 401k, a 403b, a pension plan, an IRA, a Roth IRA, all of those accounts that people have for retirement for federal tax purposes uh, would not be impacted by this tax. Um, it does not uh, it would not impact the sale of most family homes or primary residents. This, this proposal couples to federal law, which means that you get a $250,000 if you're a single or $500,000 if you're a married couple exemption on the gain, not the total sales price, but the profit on the sale of a primary residence. Um, and in fact, at the national level, gains from taxable capital gains from the sale of a, pr a primary home are less than 1% of total capital gains taxes that are collected. So tiny share. In addition to that, the governor goes further and says that if you have li owned a house, lived in it for uh, 10 years and owned it for 20 years and uh, then have rented it out, you, can all, you will be completely exempt on the sale of that property. So um, this is not a tax on primary uh, homes or family homes. Uh, it would not impact college funds, assets willed to family members. This is not a tax on dividends, which many people get um, from um, uh, individual stocks that they may own. Most employee stock options would not be impacted by this. Uh, and as Representative Jenkins said, there are added exemptions in here for timber, 
farmland and equipment and uh, small business equipment as well. So as, uh, as I sort of said at the beginning, this is really a tax on high-end financial assets, corporate stocks and bonds um, that are above $50,000 a year for a married couple. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Representative, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, and specifically, uh, maybe you can address the prospects of this uh, piece of legislation moving forward this session. You know, and I, I, in terms of prospects of passage, I, every year I think we move steps forward on capital gains. So I, I think we're moving in the right direction on it. I think it's way too early in the session to, um, to know kind of what's going to prevail in the end in terms of, of revenue proposals. But I think having this one, you know, it's never actually kind of made it on the list of serious consideration before. So I think that's a great step forward. But now I think what we're going to need is a lot of work um, both educating legislators and educating the general public about what a capital gains tax is. Because we're one of few states that, that has um, uh, that doesn't have a capital gains tax and because so few people actually claim capital gains on their federal tax form, our public and our legislators know virtually nothing about capital gains. And so people just really don't understand it. So I think that's going to be one of uh, the thing that can help us the most is people understanding what a capital gains is and, and that basically it's if you buy a stock for $100 and you sell it for $200, then that $100 differential, that's a capital gains. And you'd have to have, you know, well over 50000 of dollars of that as a couple in order for this tax to apply to you. So that's, I mean, that's just an example, but um, I think that's going to be our one of our larger challenges. So, you know, certainly we have uh, folks in the legislature who've, you know, kind of taken pledges that they won't increase taxes at all, and so it's a little bit hard to persuade those folks. But, but folks who are really worried about what's happening with the middle class, the fairness of our tax structure, uh, how we're going to fund things like K-12 education and mental health, I, I think... Um, Folks who are really worried about those kinds of things are going to take a look at this, and uh, it'll be in play. Yeah, thank you. I think you know we agree. It's uh, still very early in the game down in Olympia, um, but uh, you know, as you said, it's nice to see that um, lots of these discussions are including this type of idea this year. Um, so I know that you're going to have to jump off and leave us here in a couple minutes. Um, if there's anything else that you'd like to share, we want to open up the floor to you. Um, otherwise, uh, we've got a series of um, additional details about this proposal that uh, Andy Nicholas here with our uh, staff will go through. Yeah, I guess I, I just want to, one, thank you again for uh, having me on the call. I have no idea how many callers there are, but thanks to those folks who've joined on this one. And I really... Uh, Folks who've joined this call, I would imagine, are uh, people who are, uh, like me, a little bit wonky on this kind of stuff. And so I just, again, want to reemphasize that the general public doesn't understand this at all. So uh, getting, uh, once you understand the details, then backing out to higher level messaging and ways that we can kind of talk about this to regular folks who haven't thought about it at all is going to be very important. And I really want to ask uh, folks to start trying to think about ways that you can do that, uh, because that is going to be one of the most helpful things to pressing this, this idea forward. Uh, and with that, I'm heading off to a healthcare and wellness meeting. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a great weekend, and uh, appreciate your taking the time again. Thank you. We're going to shift now, um, and as I said, uh, Andy Nicholas is here with our staff is going to walk through a couple additional slides to provide some further details on this proposal. And I see that a few of you have chatted in questions, so we will um, make sure to carve out some time here to address those, and uh, please don't hesitate to chime in if you have a question as well. Well, thanks very much, Anne. And um, just sort of real quickly, we went through what capital gains are and what they're not. Um, now I just want to sort of go through 
high level why we think this is an important tool to add to our revenue system. And of course, any analytical discussion should start off with a comic cartoon. Um, so here you can see um, a pilot is asking someone why, uh, what's the whining sound about, and there is a response that um, it's just first class passengers discussing capital gains taxes, which emphasizes one of the major points with this, that this is indeed something that impacts only the very richest Washingtonians and people in the country. And that's because capital gains by their very nature are highly, more heavily concentrated among uh, extremely wealthy people than almost any other economic resource. And so this graph that you're about to show, that, or that we've got up here, shows that um, nationwide, all, uh, all capital gains, about 73% of them in 2012 went to millionaires. Um, that's not the richest 1%, that's closer to the richest one-tenth of 1%. One so it's a, it's a resource that is heavily concentrated among people who have benefited the most from economic growth over the past few decades. Uh, and in fact, there's been a number of studies that have come out that have shown that capital gains have been the number one driver of income inequality over the past couple of decades. And so we have an opportunity, as I said, to, to tap into a resource that has driven income inequality, but we can use it to fund investments in education, health care, public safety, and things that benefit all Washingtonians. Um, and just by putting the threshold in place, it means that we can limit the tax to just those at the very top of the income scale. So here we see, and I, I uh, see that um, one person asked for a breakdown of the 1.7%. Um, well, this is kind of it right here, um, and um, be, feel free to, if this doesn't answer your question, feel free to uh, email me or chat up uh, again later through the session. But here with that exemption threshold in place, you can see that this limits the tax to only about 1.7% of Washingtonians, and it's exclusively those uh, at the very top, I mean, there's a small tax increase on average for those with incomes between 270 and 535,000 per year, but the vast majority of it is from the top 1% category, which is uh, people with incomes of $535,000 a year or more. Um, the other thing that's important to note from this graph is that it's also a pretty modest tax increase for these people that taxes on average for the richest 1% would go up only about 1.4% of their household incomes each year. So it's not like this is a you know, gigantic tax increase. It's really a pretty modest tax increase. And again, it, the revenues would go to things that are really important for our state and for ensuring that we uh, can grow and have a prosperous future for everybody. Um, the other reason that we, because as many of you on the line know, that we do have, as Representative Jenkins said, the most regressive or upside down tax system in the country. So we know we need new revenues for education. So uh, we need to look towards a, an instrument that taxes people at the high end because we've kind of maxed out people at the low end. Um, but there's, there's good economic reasons to tax capital gains as well. Um, one of the big ones is that capital gains grow really fast over the long run, meaning that we would have an instrument in place that could actually help the state tax system overall keep pace with the costs of simply maintaining existing levels of services from one year to the next. Um, we don't really have something like that on the books right now. Uh, taxable retail sales generally don't track economic growth as well as capital gains do. Um, and you, I'm sure many of you have heard that capital gains can be volatile, um, and there is some truth to that, um, except that uh, there are smart things that policymakers can do to um, address that, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, but the other side of that coin is that capital gains, although they tank at the start of a recession, they recover much more quickly than almost any other part of the economy. And this next slide simply shows that dynamic. So here we can see since the worst part of the Great Recession, which was in, uh, we hit rock bottom at about March of 2009, we see a few economic indicators in how much they've grown since then. Employment has grown by about 4.5% since 
since the worst part of the Great Recession. Wages and salary payments have done a little better, 20%. Consumer spending up 23%. But all of those are dwarfed by growth in the stock market. The Dow Jones Industrial Average has grown by 124% since the worst part of the Great Recession. And so um, we could be benefiting from that growth right now. Uh, we would not be in quite as much financial trouble right now if we had had a capital gains tax in place. And in fact, other states that do tax capital gains have seen their finances recover more quickly than Washington has. So we would, we would have an instrument in place that could make our tax system a little bit more resilient in the long run as well. Um, uh, and so I, go ahead, Anne. No, I was just going to say uh, thank you for the, that quick overview. Um, we've got about five minutes left, so I want to make sure that we cover the questions that have been asked in um, through our chat system here, um, as promised. So thanks for everyone for sticking with us here. So the first question that came in is around um, Washington State Charities, and one of the questions is asking, um, that they've heard that some of the charities in Washington State are letting and notifying large donors that um, if they donate to the charity that they won't end up paying um, a capital gains tax. And the question is, it, you know, I think one is, is, is this true? And two, uh, if so, how does it impact the overall revenue projections? Any insight there, Andy? Um, it, it, uh, I don't know what the impact on the revenue projections are, although that they, t they take it into account. So the $800 million that we are anticipating we would get uh, in the coming biennium would account for the fact that uh, a number of people will make donations of stock, which are, would not be taxed. Those donations would not count. Um, so you can donate stocks to uh, charities, and you will not pay any tax for that. Um, um, and so, yes, it is, it is true that uh, gifts of stock uh, will not be subject to capital gains in Washington State, as they are not at the federal level. Uh, we have another question that someone is asking about losses, and are they factored in? And the answer is, the, one of the good things about this tax is that because there is a federal capital gains tax, we can use the system that is in place. And so for DOR, the process of administering it would be very simple. And federal law allows you to deduct losses against gains every year. Um, that You can deduct up to 3,000 in losses each year, but you can carry additional losses forward those provisions would carry over into Washington State's tax each year as well. So yes, you will have uh, losses will be deducted and would reduce the amount of tax you would potentially owe. Um, we have another question asking, with the $25,000 slash $50,000 exemption in place, does that mean, so the example they put forward is if you had $26,000 would you pay capital gains on $26,000 or on $1,000? And the answer is on $1,000. So everything below $25,000 is exempt, and you would only pay on the amount above that. And the same thing if you were a married couple, you would, if you had $51,000, you would exempt all of the $50,000 and pay tax on the remaining $1,000. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think those are all of the questions that we have received from you uh, thus far. We still have about two minutes left, so if there's anybody out there with a lingering question that they would like to, um, to ask, please feel free to chat in your question. We also want to remind you all that uh, this uh, budget beat call is recorded, so we will be um, uploading it to our website, which is budgetandpolicy.org, along with this slide presentation, so that you can go back and access it. With um, you know, if you if you have a question later, or you're trying to remember something, uh, we want to provide a resource for you. Looks like we have two more questions here, real quickly, that have just come in. Um, one is around uh, if there's any talking points or information that they, uh, folks can reference. So, Andy, do you want to mention uh, the resources available on the website? 
Uh, yeah, we do. We have a frequently asked questions document on our website, which goes through um, a lot of basic questions that people might have, and that is something that we update pretty frequently as we get more questions from people coming in. Um, so that is on our uh, on our website and on the Schmudget blog. Also, if you go to policy areas on our website and go to state revenue, there's a cap a whole capital gains section which you can uh, access there. Um, and we also that's, that also includes a policy brief that we've done, a number of posts with uh, graphs. Uh, and I would also uh, let you all know that we will be coming out with a sort of narrated slideshow on this that includes much of what you saw today. Um, and we have some infographics in the hopper as well. So I think that also addresses the um, other question we got about messaging. So yeah, we are um, doing everything we can here to make sure that we are trying to uh, break down what can be a very complex uh, issue here into some simple messages and talking points that uh, you know everybody can use that really does clarify some of the technical aspects of this policy. So we encourage you to uh, visit our website, budgetandpolicy.org. We'll also be um, putting, pushing this out through social media. So, uh, you can like us on Facebook or find us on Twitter. Thanks again, Anne. And I just wanted to emphasize that anybody on the call can feel free to email or call me directly if you have questions about this. I am uh, more than happy to discuss it. With that, uh, we're going to respect everyone's time and say thank you. Uh, have a great weekend, and uh, go Hawks.